Welcome to the fourth installment of our 2017 Business Boot Camp. Sorry. We provide you with a professional skill set that you would need to thrive in today's workforce, but we offer you the opportunity to network with other business leaders in our community. I'm Angie McCampbell. I am the Program Development Vista for Habitat for Humanity. We have a few, few spots left uh, on our sponsor for 2017 boot camp event if anybody is interested. The only cost is providing food for the attendees and there are many benefits to sponsoring the event such as you get visibility on Tuesday Talk and the Chamber social media sites. You also get the ability to speak at your sponsored event and then bring promotional items as well to promote your business. And here's our representative from this event's sponsor, Jason Sundberg from United Prairie Bank. Well, thank you for coming to uh, the business boot camp. Uh, again, my name is Jason Sundberg. I'm the market president at United Prairie Bank here in Owatonna. Uh, a little bit about United Prairie Bank. Uh, we are a, a local family-owned organization uh, centered here in Minnesota. We've got branches uh, all across Minnesota uh, from Worthington Wyndham to uh, Owatonna and actually up to the Spicer area. Uh, we are a full service bank. Uh, so full service, I mean we offer a full gamut of consumer banking, mortgage, business banking, and agricultural products. Uh, so we've got you covered. We also have uh, an insurance division and an actual financial network that offers uh, different investment 401k management services. I do have some other representatives from the bank here with me, and actually if you guys wanted to stand up, I can make introductions for you or you can introduce yourselves. Um, why don't we start here with you, Mr. Klinkner. My name is Tim Klinkner. I'm happy to be back in Owatonna. I was uh, started off 35 years ago, spent 15, left for 20, and now I'm back. <laughs> John? I'm John Ben, uh, work in the agriculture and commercial lending, and I'm trying to think I'm in my 15th year of lending so far. Okay, great. Mr. Tronson? My name is Eric Tronson. I am the investment advisor at United Prairie Financial Inside the Bank and uh, specializing in retirement plans for businesses and so forth. And the alphabet soup behind my name is all focused on that. I've <laughs> so, uh, been in Owatonna now at uh, United Prairie for three years and I've been in the business since 1999. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a heck of a ride. Great. But a privilege to work in Owatonna. Super. Mr. Corey Shaw. I am standing up, just so you know. <laughs> Corey Shaw, I've uh, been with the bank uh, for about two and a half years, been in the banking industry for almost 20. So uh, and I, uh, part of my role is actually working with small businesses and larger corporations on the uh, business banking side. So glad to see everybody here. Great. Well, thank you for your introductions. Again, Jason, as the market president, uh, I've been in banking roughly 20 years. Um, I'm a new uh, transplant to Olatana from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I've been here roughly uh, 18 months, uh, so a year and a half. Uh, moved my family here, settled in with my four daughters, and uh, looking forward to, to growing with Olatana and, and you as uh, 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 city members and other business associates. I'm sorry, lost my tongue there. So. That is, is what I have. I appreciate you all coming out. Thank you for the opportunity to sponsor and uh, yeah, have a great event. Today our topic is promoting and branding your business. This event will cover best practices to brand and promote your business, explain all the options available to us locally and why these are successful and important marketing components for businesses to integrate into their marketing plan. I would now like to introduce one of our presenters today. Kate Harthen works at Corporate Recognition. It is both Kate's current and first job, though her responsibilities are slightly different now than would have been 20 years ago in the business world today. With degrees in both Business management and human resources, Kate is working to prepare the company for quick growth in upcoming years by refining internal operations, developing marketing strategies, and performing various HR functions. She is also a board member for the Society for Human Resources Management, Owatonna Business Partnership, and 
Owatonna Symphony Orchestra. She was recently recognized by Owatonna Businesswomen as a young careerist and is currently working towards certification as a promotional products adv advocacy speaker. Our other presenter today is Glenda Smith, who is an account manager for Tri-M Graphics. She has lived in Owatonna for 18 years and has been with Tri-M for the past 17 years. She is an Iowa native and a graduate of Waldorf College and Iowa State University. She has degrees in journalism and communication, or journalism communications and business. In her role at Tri-M, she helps Businesses and organizations create marketing ma materials and the goal of helping them increase their sales, visibility, and awareness with the products and services that they have to offer. Please, please join me in welcoming Kate and Glenda. Thank you, everyone. We're really excited to be here presenting for you today, and we're really excited to be doing this together. Um, you might not know we work pretty closely together. Um, Triumph does a lot of the design elements for if you're starting a logo or you have a specific marketing campaign, um, and we do the product side. So we're often emailing back and forth, sharing logos. You might not have it saved in the right format. So um, it's a really good partnership for us to do that. So we're going to be speaking today on branding, um, the overall concept of branding and what exactly that means for you. A lot of you might have logos created, but there's definitely steps that you can take to um, work with different color schemes and continuing to develop your brand maybe apart from the logo. So I'll let Glenda kick this off. All right, so we um, see branding to be one of the most misunderstood um, items in our industry. How many would say that you have a brand for your company or, or organization? Okay. And how many would say you have a logo for your company or organization? All right. So those are very different things. They obviously do, um, they work together. A logo is something that you definitely need as a part of your brand. But we see a lot of um, people who will come in and rather than taking the time to develop their brand so they can create a good logo, a lot of times they are expecting to just get a logo that they can use on marketing materials. And we would um, kind of, most of our, our presentation today covers more of the marketing piece and how our businesses can help um, create those pieces to help get your business out there and in the right market. However, one of the most important components before creating that is um, developing a brand. So um, we're going to cover the establishing your brands before we get into the understanding your logo usage. So first, um, I want to talk a little bit about what a brand is. Um, it's, it's the process involved in creating a unique name and image for your products in the consumer's minds, mainly through advertising campaigns and with a consistent theme. Branding aims at establishing a significant and differentiated presence in the market that attracts and retains loyal customers. So that's a big, long definition, but the main points that we want to make sure that um, is covered is it's a process. A brand doesn't just happen. Um, you want to be intentional when you're creating your brand so that you have control over what your brand becomes. Um, what should your brand do? It should definitely clearly deliver your message as a business or organization. It should confirm your credibility um, and emotionally con connect your target prospects to your product and service. It should also motivate your buyer and create user loyalty. It's interesting, a lot of these concepts, I, <coughs> in my mind, I would apply more to the marketing side. So you have your logo, but now, now you're gonna buy a product. Well, I want it to clearly, that product to deliver your message clearly and connect <coughs> to your target market and motivate the buyer to buy and create the loyalty. So the product is doing that, but with um, Glenda and Triam, they do that when they're starting creating a logo and developing all of this for their customers. So defining your message, how can you do that? What questions can you ask yourself um, and maybe your team as a part of your business? What problem can you solve for your customers? 
That's an important question to ask because that is something that you want to make sure you're enforcing throughout all of your message. And also, what about your background product or service sets you apart from the competition? Those are two questions that are very important to ask yourself before moving into developing your brand. Um, and I think defining your buyer, that is something that I think most people are pretty clear about. Um, they need to know who their buyer is before they can market to the right person. So who are their, what are their demographics? Where do their tastes and interests lie? Um, what are their behavioral traits? And then also detailing their problems and going back to defining your message, how can you solve those problems? All of this about defining your buyer really comes out in even the colors that you would use for your logo, any sort of styles, what products or paper you're putting your logo on. And asking yourself these questions and actually taking time to write these things down um, can kind of help you bring everything together when you're developing your brands. Um, confirming your credibility. Share examples of your integrity of past experiences. How do you intend to help your customers? What are your capabilities? And show how you've delivered results. Showing some examples of each of those, and again, getting that down on paper so that you can build your brand is important. So one of the um, biggest things that you see now, especially with social media, it's easier to emotionally connect your prospects with your product or services. There are a gazillion different ways of being able to connect to people easily and quickly. Um, people buy from people that they like and can relate to. They want to know that you know who they are. So making the customer a priority, um, obviously you see that with serving customers daily. You need to make them a priority. Get close and interact and listen. Listen is probably the hardest one in any facet of um, business because you want to be able to tell everybody what you can do. But listen first so you can find out what they are needing. Um, develop the company's personality. And again, that is just building on your brand um, before you get out there and promote yourself. So what motivates your buyer? It depends on who your buyer is. Um, consider creating a branding story. That is something that people can relate to. Maybe it's um, a problem that you're solving for your client or customer. Um, and then embracing the underdog status. Were you a company that started in your garage and now you've built out um, to be serving the public in a very public way? What is it that brought you to the top? There's something that got you there. What is that? Share that story. Redefining an experience. Um, what made it unique? The GoPro is kind of a, a big thing for being able to share the experience as the person who's telling the story. Um, that makes it a unique way of sharing that story. Foster your community of fans. Does anybody think of a, um, a company that definitely builds on their fan base, their automatic lovers of the, the product or service? Can you think of anything that you've Apple. seen? Apple. Apple, perfect, perfect example. Harley you don't, Davidson. what's that? Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson. You don't see them straying away from that brand. They definitely have hardcore customers that aren't going to walk away from that product. Um, having visible founders, what is their story? Are the people that founded the company still a big part of the daily interaction? And why? Is a lot of times a company is started because that person has, um, maybe it's a trade that they're really good at. What, they're still a part of the daily interaction of, of the business. Know who you are and what you stand for and make that connection to those people who are on that same level. And then doing good, how are you helping the community? Those are all great ways to build your brand story. Um, most of the time you don't want to do three or four of them. Pick one and use it strongly. Create user loyalty by building trust. Um, Steve Covey's 13 behaviors that create trust with co consumers um, is a huge um, business. It's in the um, the Speed of Trust. Have any of you read that book, The Speed of Trust? 
Um, they talk about these 13 things that creates trust, and not just with consumers or customers. It's within all facets of um, your life. And so focusing on those 13 behaviors to create that, lo or to create that trust, and then therefore um, creating your consumer loyalty. Part of your brand is um, customer <coughs> perception as well, which is why she's going over some of these bullet points. And that's your current customer perception and potential cu customer perception. Um, what do they think of when they see your logo? What do they think of when they see you or your employees? Um, so all of this really plays into your brand apart from the logo. And you can start doing whatever marketing you want. But if you have a negative perception for whatever reason, it's not going to have the desired effect. So why is covering the branding part, um, why is that important for what we're specifically talking today? You just can't separate it. You need to be able to cover those branding questions so that you can develop a logo that actually portrays what your company is about. Um, a lot of people want the quick fix of a logo. They want something in an hour or two or maybe a week if they have a lot of time. But really um, pinning down those and answering those questions about your business before you get too far into developing a look is so important for the long haul. Um, because your brand is the perceived image of your business as a whole. It's not just a graphic. A lot of people get confused with the difference between a brand and a logo. Your logo identifies your business as its simplest form with an icon. Sometimes it's just text. Um, when you see the Nike swoosh, you know it's Nike without the text, right? Under Armour, Starbucks, all of those, you know exactly what that is before you even see any words connected to that. Logos are derived from the business it symbolizes, therefore the branding piece of it is very important. I'm kind of curious, Glenda, we didn't talk about this before, <coughs> but how often when people are wanting to develop a logo, do they just come to you and say, well, here's a picture of one that I like, and a picture of another one that I like, mm -hmm. and another one that I like. Could we do something that mixes all of these together? Is that um, common? If we actually had that much information, <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> a lot of people will come to us and say, I need a logo. And um, you can develop a logo. There's a lot of tools and even like publisher that can give you some kind of funky looking graphics. But um, if you really want something that talks about your business and um, shows your business, you really need to sit down and, and tell yourself what your business is about. Some, some especially small businesses, if they started off um, doing what they do great and all of a sudden people are asking them to do things for them, they haven't really thought about a lot of those questions. They're just reacting to what um, they're being asked to do. And so it's a really good exercise no matter where you're at in your business to be able to walk through some of those questions and really pin down who you are, and then develop that image or that graphic that can tell the rest of the world about you. Okay, understanding logo usage, keeping your brand consistent. This is kind of a fun part for us because people come to us and be like, I like that color on this one item. Let's put my logo on that. And I'm like, it's not a color you've ever used in anything before. But I mean, that's not, that's not always bad to do that. Um, but maintaining some consistency is something that we, we end up working with quite a bit. I think you're going to talk about this as well. Um, how to use your brand and how not to. All right. Um, so using your logo and design elements consistently. Why is that important? Um, it's so you don't start with something and each piece you develop, you get farther and farther away from what you originally um, created. So what we um, do a lot for customers that come to us that need logos designed, we develop their logo guidelines. And it's not just for print, it is for all marketing um, areas. And we will go in and we'll develop what is acceptable for use with this logo. And um, a lot of times, it's very helpful to be able to go back to that because it ends up making the creation process of your marketing materials a lot more simple. You narrow down choices, and instead of having to feel like you have to be super creative about what you're doing, you have something to go back to, and it, it really pulls it together so that the look is the same. 
Um, you manage, if you manage your orders for print and promotional materials through a single department, if you're a larger company, that's also helpful because they can kind of be the logo police on some of those larger companies. Um, creating a shared folder on your company network is helpful too, so employees that are, that have the capabilities to use your logo, they have good materials and good files to use, so they're not pulling stuff off websites or pulling stuff that doesn't look right on, on a lot of different things. Um, creating social media images for your, um, that's consistent with your guidelines. That's important because when you're putting your logo or whatever it might be on your Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, whatever it is, you don't want it to be so stretched and out of whack that you can't tell who it is. So sizing it appropriately for those mediums is important. And also providing um, templates and sharing templates with your company for maybe they're doing a presentation or there's slides that you can put together so that's consistent with the look of the rest of the guidelines. We're going to walk through um, a little bit of how Triam does their logo creation and guidelines. So this is even useful for you. If you have a logo, how many of you have a logo, first of all? That's more than just text. Okay, so most of you, um, maybe you don't have these branding guidelines that incorporate color and spacing around your logo. You can still do that now. So this will be a really good run through. This is a fun one because, oh, I'm on the board for the Otana Business Partnership and they just kind of kicked off last spring um, designing a logo and Triumph did that so you get to see kind of a recent example of how they started what we were trying to communicate um, what to do and what not to do Go ahead. <laughs> um, this just kind of shows an example of stretching your logo an extremely common practice we see all the time because you just want to make it fit in the space that's available not a good idea you can see over on the right hand side there um, the first graphic shows how you should stretch it both directions equally, so it's going to be sized appropriately. The other two graphics has one kind of squished together and the other one's squished down. And those, um, just not a good way to use your logo. We see it all the time, so don't feel bad if you're guilty of this. Everybody does it. But it is a good practice to stay away from just to keep things consistent with your logo guidelines. And again, enforcing your brand and making sure that when somebody sees that logo, they know who it is right away. Um, always be sure to use the colors that were created with the palette. It doesn't necessarily mean you can only use orange, blue, and yellow, but there's a palette of colors that you're keeping consistent with all of your marketing materials. Um, Sure, I was just skipping up to the color palette here. So they created a couple of um, options. We wanted it to be a really fun <coughs> logo and also for people to recognize it just by the OBP or even just by the shopping tag. So that shopping tag on there, what does that mean to you? If, we, if it if just said Oatana Business Partnership, what would you think? Anybody? Just any business is mm -hmm. in it. Um, but with that shopping tag, it's really more geared towards the retail stores. So not even necessarily corporate recognition, even though I'm helping out on the board for it, but like the Oatana Shoe and Christie's and all of those. So we want it to be able to be separated. And if we just say OBP, eventually, hopefully people will understand what we mean. Um, and you can tell here, even though they created this color palette, you can see what doesn't really look good versus what, so on the left there, versus what does on the right. That yellow background just doesn't, the colors don't look great over it, just the red and blue and yellow, not necessarily the best combination. Just a quick question, but is that incorporating like brand progression? I was just going to say, it's important when you're creating <coughs> guidelines to be flexible. Um, you do want to make sure that you have to think way beyond what's currently being created because you may not have the options to do something in color. So this is an acceptable practice to do a black and white um, option. And the progression. That's what I was thinking with the OBP. Yep, eventually you should be able to use the tag as people start to recognize that all together yeah. as an icon for OBP. So um, that's a, yeah, that was a good thought. Good. And there's not really in the logo anything that's 
overlapping too much. We, we convert full color to one color frequently, and sometimes it's challenging because you have two colors that are hitting each other, yeah. and then while well, I have the option to make one solid and then one just outlined, which doesn't always look the best, yeah. um, or make them both solid mm -hmm. and then you can't see the outline. So, and you'll see that um, a couple options for resizing and stuff. I wanted well. to go back to the choosing your color palette. Um, you can see that um, there's additional colors that are available to you, so you're not just stuck with those three logo colors, but keeping consistent with that throughout all facets of your, um, your media is just important. And I don't know if you can see, there's four different um, color swatches that are listed there, because every company or every type of company that's creating promotional material uses a different process. So the top one is the Pantone matching system, the PMS system, which gives you a very specific number that matches every color. So that's terminology. If we say PMS, we are talking about color numbers. <laughs> Just to clarify. <laughs> and <laughs> there's clearly Tons of options here. Um, I'm going to pass this around um, just to give you guys an idea. There are so many colors, and you don't, you don't even know until you look through this book how many colors there are. I think it's just ridiculous, and I work with this all the time. Um, but we, I just flagged in here Federated's technical PMS color number, which is a number 484. And then you'll see right above it, we, we work with stock colors a lot. So sometimes they'll charge extra to mix their exact PMS color. Or, or they'll have the option to choose the stock color. So at 485 to 484, there's a pretty big difference. And Federated does switch off between the two depending on what they're doing or how much it costs to get that mix. Um, and what's to give you an idea. important about that specifically is you might, for certain reasons, have to stray away from your original color. But being able to go back to that each time keeps you pretty close. If you were to stray away, and then go to something else where you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to match the pen that I just did. That's even farther away from the original. What's the, the game original. where you're all whispering? Yeah. <laughs> telephone. <Whatever. laughs> the telephone game, yeah. And it can easily get further and further from the accurate original. So there may be scenarios where you just don't have a choice. I know for us, paper colors are a lot more limited than ink colors. But having this to go back to as kind of your guideline is, is super helpful, so you're always within the way that somebody's going to look at that and be like, oh, that's OBP. But um, also CMYK, we use both Pantone matching system and the CMYK, which brings cyan, magenta, yellow, and black all together to create that color. Um, a lot of places will use RGB, so those numbers are listed there too. And then at the very bottom, those are the uh, web colors that um, coordinate with those original <laughs> colors picked. So between people printing your product, or printing your paper, printing your product, and doing your website, they might all use these different color number <coughs> schemes. So it's nice to have um, one set for each of these so that you do have that original for, for every aspect of your marketing to go back to. And then we also um, will do some suggested fonts that, again, keep it consistent. It's not that you might never, ever, ever use a different font to go with some of your marketing materials, but it brings you back to what's acceptable. And we try to pick something that is going to be somewhat um, consistent through web all the way through print, because sometimes there's different options on a PC than there is a Mac. So picking a basic font is helpful um, to make sure that it can look similar throughout all of the media. We'll just kind of go through this quickly. This is part of what Tri-M does. When they put together the brand, they show it on all of these different things just to give you an idea of the consistency. And showing the OBP logo on the website, how it appears um, kind of up in the corner so you can see all of those colors, and then also just the tag that's on our Facebook page. Thank you, Holly, West Brack Marketing, for that. <laughs> um, art file types, this is kind of a topic that I end up talking with everyone about because it's something most people probably don't understand. We're working in artwork programs on a daily basis, so we're going to say, oh, I need an EPS file from you. You know, when I start working from a with a new customer, 
I need an EPS file, and people are like, well, what is that? I have this thing, but I can't open it. Well, it's, it's for Adobe Illustrator. Don't delete it. If Trium creates something for you, they're going to give you um, the basic things, the files that you need to have on hand, or if they don't, I'll just get it from them later. <laughs> um, but a lot of people end up deleting these files that I would need to proportionally dis resize your logo or delete the background so that I can print clearly on a product um, just because you can't open it. So we are usually using this first one, Adobe Illustrator. It pops up as .ai, .eps, or sometimes .pdf. Um, Photoshop, we're usually just doing if it's a full color picture, you have your retractable banners, or you're getting a full color table cover or something like that. And InDesign, you said you guys use most frequently for creating. Yeah. Coral Draw and Paint, um, not as much, but it just pops up. Most frequently people are like, here, I have a JPEG of my logo, but that's kind of, it's a picture file. So if you take a picture with your cell phone um, and you want to print it like 30 by 40 size or something, is it going to be a really clear picture? No. <laughs> So the same thing comes into play here. I can't take a JPEG and put it on a coffee tumbler. Um, it's just going to be blurry. Or a retractable <laughs> banner, it's just going to be blurry. So I have, we have resources where we can send it in to get redrawn, but ultimately if you have those original files, it's a lot better. Um, so a couple of files that don't work, sometimes people create things in Microsoft Word. We can send it to get redrawn, it's like ten dollars, you know, then we'll have it, but it might not be exactly right. Um, so just for your information. Pulling your logo off your website, that top option is kind of what it ends up looking like because that's just a JPEG and I resized and it got blurry. So obviously they're di the different colors as well, um, but the bottom one I actually was able to do in our EPS file, so it's a lot clearer. And you will see, with these color differences, I can send you a photo, and it's going to look completely different on your computer screen than it's going to look on my computer screen. We have calibrators for our monitors so that it appears as closely as possible. But just because everybody has their screen settings different and different computers, it could look completely different. I even have two screens on my desk, and if I drag one over here and it's not been calibrated lately, I'm like, oh, that looks really weird. <laughs> um, yeah. oh, what, um, oh, a little bit. One of the things to note too, if you're wondering why the top one is more blurry than the bottom one, uh, websites don't require as high resolution images to make them look clear. So that's where the confusion comes in a lot of times. People are like, oh, I'll just grab my, my logo off my website. We can do that, but it it's not nearly as clear as it would be if we had some of those original files in the last slide um, towards the top there. And websites, the reason they need smaller graphics is so the speed is, is better. If, if websites were to use the graphics that we need for printing, it would slow your website down a lot. And that's why there's a difference between those two. So for us, um, the common printing methods that we use, we um, digital is very, very common in the last 10 to 15 years. It's becoming more and more common. It allows us to print full color for a lot less expensive. It used to be where if you weren't ordering thousands of pieces, full color could be a little bit um, expensive to do like 10 posters. But now we have the option to do digital that just makes color printing a lot more affordable and a lot more realistic for a is lot that, of people. Is that a new machine you have? Um, yeah, we've, we've probably had it for the last 15, 12 to 15 years, but it definitely different than um, the full color process, that third bullet there, um, which requires, it, we do offset printing and so there's plates involved and there's just a lot more steps to the process. It makes it much more economical if you are doing really large quantities because then it's just running. But when you have, you know, you want 50 brochures, then we would go the digital route, um, which also allows us to do variable and personalized printing. That's something where not only can you change out text, but maybe you want to target um, a certain group of people with a certain graphic. You can change that out in all of the same print run. And then spot color, that Pantone book that is getting passed around, that's something that we still commonly do because um, 
you know, for envelopes, you don't necessarily always need full color envelopes, but um, it's something that is avail available. And then foil stamping and blind embossing. I had some samples here. Um, sometimes you're not always using color to do the printing. It's more of a method that is pass that down. The top one is the embossing. And then um, foil stamping, and then you can do a mix of both foil st stamping and embossing if you want to together. So on products, it gets to be really interesting. The closest to what Triam is doing for us is a digital print <coughs> for color process. This is becoming more and more common because people are developing their color logos and it really does pop more than just a one color on pretty much anything you're gonna print. Um, so I don't have any samples of that here, um, but you'll be able to see also probably from what, did you pass along before color process? Um, or you see the posters, so you kind of know what that is. <laughs> um, dye sublimation, this more goes into fabric. So in lanyards or towels, it's actually, the color is going into the fibers of the item rather than just pressing on top of it. Um, lasering, engraving, debossing. You've probably all seen samples of this before. We do a lot of laser engraved mugs, so a stainless steel, like a blue stainless steel mug, you can laser, it's gonna show through to the color, the original silver of the mug. Um, then <laughs> embroidery, heat transfer, more on the clothing side, if you're interested in that, I can give you some more details. Pad printing and screen printing are some of the most common that we use. So this one, I just brought a chamber glass from the golf tournament, and I'm gonna pass this around. This looks like it's actually engraved in there, but if you feel it, it's a screen print. They have a, a kind of fake etch, they call it a frost etch um, screen print that they press on top so it doesn't go into the item itself. Um, but with that laser engraving, I have a plaque here that actually shows you can feel how it's etched into the item. We also do a little bit of the foil stamping and um, debossing on products, so I'll pass those along down here. How are we doing for time? Two? Okay. I had a little video, but I think in the interest of time, we'll skip it. It was just showing how they create a screen for your logo and how it actually rolls around the item to print. It's a really interesting process, and we could probably get that out to you guys um, later or talk to me if you're interested in seeing it. I think this got mixed up from a little bit earlier, but just showing the consistency of branding across multiple sizes of imprint. You know, the imprint space on a pen is quite a bit smaller than it is on a tote bag. Um, KGLY has done quite a few different things, so you can see, I tried to make it proportionate, but listed the sizes. So they have these cutting boards, um, or their tote bag, or measuring spoons, and even though maybe the information is different on each thing, or rearranged, they always have that logo on there, and that fits pretty well on whatever they're printing. So we hesitate to talk about specific items that everyone should have because we don't necessarily think there is. No business, <laughs> no business needs exactly the same thing. Um, business cards are pretty common still. Even in the digital age, everybody needs a business card to hand out. But um, these are common things that we see. Um, some people don't have a need for letterhead anymore. Some people can't live without it. So it really just depends on your business. Uh, pens, pretty much everyone has those <coughs> magnets. If you're just getting a business started, maybe you want car magnets just for your vehicle to drive around, otherwise the business card magnets. Calendars, if your customers use those, you can get the sticky ones that go across the bottom of the computer. I, I use one. It's so handy. Badge or logoed clothing and bags are pretty common items. And then as your business grows, these are more, for us, I guess I had categories rather than specific products. So if you have salespeople going out, should they have something that they leave behind, whether they talk to someone or not? Um, do you need to have a years of service program for your employees? They really appreciate it. Um, current customer gifts, great around the holidays or on their one year anniversary. Wellness program items. Um, 
you're getting discounts now, a lot of companies, for having a wellness program, and incentive products are a great piece to get your employees going towards their goals, and exhibit or display pieces for the fairs. Um, the percentages at the bottom are how people that use promotional products use them. So it doesn't equal 100 because they're using it for multiple things at the same time. As we're wrapping up here, <laughs> why print and why product? Um, print, um, people still like to have something in their hand, and a lot of times we still see, even though digital and um, social media is huge, we see a lot of people who need to get their customers to those places. So we see people using print media to um, guide them to websites or social media or that type of thing. Um, it helps establish your brand. It's still the credible, um, you know, there's a lot of, you hear about the fake news stories. Well, print tends to be more credible. There was, there was money put forth to um, create those products. So it does tend to be one of the more credible pieces still. It's engaging, people have something in their hands, um, and it drives your customers to the online presence. And there is a longer shelf life if you need something that does have um, some longevity to it, print is a good way to do that. Why product? It allows you for a more exact targeting of a specific demographic. So a lot of the times you're, you're advertising in the paper, you're advertising wherever. A lot of people are gonna see that that are not your target market. And that's not a bad thing, but when you have a product, you're not only choosing where to give it out, which hopefully is meeting your target market, but you're choosing the product to fit what that demographic might use. Um, it's not an interruption. So not to knock anybody else, because I truly believe that a combination of marketing methods gets you the best results. Um, but if you are listening to music in the car, you have a long car ride, and you get there's a bunch of ads on the radio, what do you probably do? Change, Change the station. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you are just trying to read an article in the paper, and there's ads all over, are you going to, you know, it says continue on page five. Are you going to flip to page five, or are you going to pause to look at all the ads in between? So <laughs> maybe, depending on what it is, if something really catches your eye. Um, but when you're giving somebody something, I mean, they have the option to take it or not. So the most valuable forms of marketing are consumed voluntarily. They're taking it as saying, hey, this is a really nice thing. I will use this. It's not junk, hopefully, if you chose the right thing. Um, touches all five senses, so you can get a, an emotional response. We do print on chocolate, so <laughs> if you want to taste something, <laughs> you can do that. Um, but ultimately, print and product together really work well. And I have a couple handouts that will be on the table as you're leaving today. Um, we're having some events next week, but we have a product that clips a couple postcards into it. So you're getting a thing that you're gonna hang on to for a really long time, but you're also getting this information, you know, double-sided postcard so that you can carry it with you. Um, and you have our logo for a while, but you know about the stuff that's coming up right away. Skipping. Okay, um, just a couple FAQs, what's the setup charge for creation of the screen, um, I can give you more details, how long does it take to get, usually about two weeks for us, how about you? Um, anywhere from an hour to two weeks, maybe yeah. ten minutes, depending. We can do 24 hour rush too, <laughs> just saying. Depends on what you're looking for. <laughs> and the printing in house, Triumph does, but we don't. Um, and any work outside of Oatana, we are a national company, our second largest company customer is actually out of El Paso, Texas. So, how about you? Um, yeah, we do quite a bit of work, obviously, locally, but it's nationally, and I guess our farthest customer is in Israel. Cool. Mm -hmm. cool. Any other quick questions? Um, how often do you change your brand? I'm not talking about like Starbucks that puts the red in at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm talking about freshening, on, freshening a brand. You see some companies go back to the vintage if they've been mm -hmm. around a long mm -hmm. time. How often should you or, or, or do you advocate changing your brand? I would say, um, you know, once you get to the five to seven years, you, you definitely want to get to the point where your brand is established before you make a lot of changes. Once your brand is established in whatever your market is, um, you know, like Starbucks does for the Christmas time, you can add a little bit here and there without taking away from that. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of people need, really needing to freshen up the look. Somewhere between five and seven years is 
you're starting to notice that things are getting a little bit old looking. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen with the whole logo shift. For us, we noticed a lot of our customers were doing full color, and so we're like, oh gee, we should put our logo in full color. So we left kind of the layout the same, kept the font the same, um, but just added the colors into the diamond in our logo and just using it a couple different ways in social media. So it was still, it's still really recognizable, um, didn't change any major parts of it, and re but freshened it up. rebranding itself, um, you know, some companies, it, it's more of a progression. Maybe three years later, like, you know what, we need to freshen up these colors to a little bit more current look. It's not always a total revamp. Usually it's not. It's more of a progression that's kind of changing with what's necessary. Thank you. <laughs>